Welcome back to the Joseph Carlson Show. On this episode, we have a lot of news to get to. The headline news today is it's basically been confirmed. This isn't official official, but the Fed is on path for another 75 basis point interest rate uh, hike uh, to fight inflation. That's the news here. Now, I'm going to go over this. I'm going to go over why I think this is predicted and my personal predictions on inflation and how that will impact my portfolio. But we also have some other news I want to cover. There is a little bit of controversy, just a tiny bit about the premiere of, of Amazon's new Ring, Rings of Power series, The Lord of the Rings. And I'm going to give my take on it, whether I think it was a success, a failure, somewhere in between, whether I think it was good or bad for Amazon, all that good stuff. And I also want to compare it to other epic series that people are talking about right now, like House of Dragon uh, and Warner Brothers Discovery. So we're going to be looking at that stock as well both Amazon and Warner Brother Discovery. And finally, as long as we're on the subject of media, we have breaking news today, which is a bigger confirmation that Netflix is now doing aggressive cost cutting, which is never something I really love to see with my companies. This usually spells trouble for them. So as always, we have a lot to jump into in this episode, a lot to cover. We're also gonna be looking at my portfolio and doing a full update. So if you like this type of content, make sure to hit the like button, Subscribe to the channel with the little bell icon. Now let's go ahead and jump right in. Um, we have the story fund here, which is my tech portfolio. I have two portfolios for those not aware. One of them is called the passive income account, which is a dividend growth portfolio. And the other one, which is this one, the story fund, is more of a tech-centered uh, growth company, but it's focused on free cash flow. But most of the companies in this portfolio are either very fast growing or they're tech companies. Um, but Either way, the goal of this portfolio over the past year has been to outperform the S&P 500 over a five-year basis. Now, I started it at the beginning of 2021. That, in hindsight, wasn't a good time to pour in $100,000, but we are where we're at right now. And right now, we're down $32,000. In the past trailing 30 days, we're down 8.2%, which is $9,000. So we've, we've ticked down another $9,000, but over the past three months, we're basically flat. We're down 1.7%. So the portfolio over the past 90 days has actually just been zigging and zagging. Um, and then all time down 32,000, which the money weighted returns a little different way of weighting it. If we look at the actual holdings here, we're down 22% on the actual invested capital. Now, what I do is every week I compare this against the S&P 500. Even though I have a long investment horizon, I like to just do a quick comparison here so you can see what's going on. The story fund is the blue line. The S&P 500 is the red line. And this takes into account my deposits and I haven't done any withdrawals. So this is as if I deposited money into each of these at the exact same time and the exact same amounts. And what it does is it displays an alternate reality as if I would have invested in the S&P 500. If I would have invested in the S&P 500 so far, it would have done better because tech companies in the QQQ, these type of companies in general have fared poorly over the past year. Now, right now, the S&P 500 would be up. I'd be in the green by half a percent. My portfolio is down 19%. So that's the comparison. Um, one thing I'll mention, though, is uh, with investing, we like to look at instant feedback and make judgments based off of that. But we probably shouldn't. We probably should look at feedback that's on a multi-year basis. So my actual investments, I don't really take this as feedback right away. I want to see how they do over five years. If over five years, they underperform to a huge extent, then that's feedback that I can say, look, my picks didn't do well. These stocks weren't good choices. I should have stuck with different value companies or low PE companies or something different. But right now, I think it's too early in the game to call it. And like I said, I'm going to be tracking the performance until 2025. Now, the biggest bets in my portfolio, the ones that I want to go over, and they're part of this related news, is Amazon, then Google, then Netflix. And Netflix has been by far the biggest loser. Uh, Amazon, I think, has done okay. It's down a little bit, but it's a, very, it's a very big holding in this portfolio. The news that is the top news of the day, this is the headline news, is that the Fed is on track to raise interest rates 75 basis points. When I think about interest rates going up and inflation. Um, we just saw Bill Ackman give an interview and his tone has entirely changed. If you've been following what he's been saying, three or four months ago on Twitter, 
his tone was that you should be panicked. You should be incredibly concerned. Inflation is out of control. He was doing comparisons against inflation now to the 1970s. He's saying that the Fed is behind the curve and on and on and on. Now in a couple months time, he's saying kind of the opposite, that things are under control, that inflation should start to tick down incrementally. And that's been the, the thought process that I've had for a long time. I put out a video around five months ago, four months ago, saying that I think we're around peak inflation. That was my opinion on it. And it was very controversial at the time because inflation was on a steady track upward. Well, inflation did go up. The measurement did go up the following two months after that video. So it wasn't the exact peak, but now inflation's starting to go back down. And the Fed continues to raise interest rates the entire time. Why does this matter for these type of holdings? Well, inflation matters a lot. The Fed's interest rates matter a lot. These companies have a lot of their profits out in the future. And the higher that inflation is, the higher that the Fed needs to raise interest rates. And interest rates change the amount of discount rate for these companies, which makes their future earnings earn uh, worth less money. That's the issue. So the higher interest rates go, the, the less these companies' futures earnings are worth. And that drives down the prices of these companies. So to summarize this, with this news, it's completely expected. I think this was 100% expected. This was no surprise to me that the Fed's going to raise another 75 basis points. I think it will be surprising if they do anything different, frankly. But what I think this will have is the effect of driving down inflation. I really do. I see already some data showing that inflation is on the way down. Um, I don't see a lot of data showing that it's on the way up. We have commodity prices coming down. Fuel costs have basically leveled out a little bit. Uh, they're not going up anymore. We have a lot of retailers like Target and other big companies that have an excess of inventory. They can't get rid of all their products. And I think all of these factors drive inflation down. And at the same time, I don't think that wage inflation is out of control. So my prediction on this news and on inflation in the future is the same that it has been for the past five months. I think about three or four months ago, we hit peak inflation, and I think it's going to steadily come down over the next year. And I think in a year or so, it will be three or 4%. That's my prediction on it. What I think that will do is for these type of companies, I think it will be a benefit. If inflation starts to come down, that means the Fed no longer has to raise interest rates, which means that these companies' future earnings are worth more. They're discounted to a lesser extent. And after combating inflation and bringing it down, if the Fed can eventually bring back down the interest rates, then it will make these companies' earnings worth even more. So my strategy, what I'm actually doing in regard to macroeconomics and how I'm investing during this is I'm just holding. I have a lot of time. I'm not using leverage. I can wait out any turbulence. I have time on my side. So I have the luxury of just waiting for interest rates to come down, for inflation to come down, and for these companies to benefit. But right now, it's, it's been difficult. There's no way around it. Now, I want to move on to this news here, which was slightly controversial, just a little bit. Amazon debuted their Rings of Power series, and it had people that had various opinions on it. Now, of course, with a series as big as Lord of the Rings, with a company as big as Amazon taking on this project, and with their billion dollar budget that they put into this, I knew that this would cause some buzz. It would cause a stir. It might cause some outrage. And it certainly did all of those things. So if that was what Amazon was going for, they accomplished it. They got a lot of people talking about their show. Now, the problem for Amazon is a lot of people talking about the show didn't like it. And they didn't like it for lots of different reasons. I'm not going to go in and say whether or not it's warranted for people to dislike something. It's opinion. Everybody has the right to dislike something. So if you didn't enjoy the show, I'm not saying you're wrong or anything like that. But I will say that there's a strong culture of outrage, especially online. When I looked at reviews of the, the Rings of Power series from different popular YouTubers and even smaller YouTubers, it was almost like a, a, a one-upsmanship contest to be more outraged about the series than the other YouTuber. You have to be even more offended about what's going on with Amazon and how they're destroying everything Tolkien ever built than the other guy. And the, the thumbnails are, of course, uh, as, as clickbait worthy as you could, you could imagine. So I see that going on. There's a strong outrage culture, a lot, of angry, uh, a lot of angry people. Some of them I think are fans of Tolkien. Some of them I don't think are fans of Tolkien. But either way, it caused a lot of controversy. To illustrate this in the data, this is what a normal high-rated series looks like. This is Blackbird from Apple TV+. 
I watched this series with my wife and it's a little bit disturbing. You have to have that warning. It's a, the subject matter is, is very disturbing, but the series is very good. And this is a normal distribution of ratings that you would see on a decent series. About 20% gave it 10 stars. Um, I, you know, I think it could potentially be 10 stars. I don't think it was necessarily perfect, but it was a very good series. 28% give it nine stars. And we have the most, the most people giving it eight stars, which I think is most appropriate. I'd probably be in that basket. Eight out of 10. Very good. Uh, and then it tapers off from there. Seven, seven out of 10, six, five, and then a few people that absolutely hated it, right? This is the normal distribution of a rating on IMDb for a show. And this is what an abnormal distribution of ratings looks like. This is 118,000 ratings on IMDb. 32% are rating it 10 out of 10. Perfect. Flawless. The greatest series ever. 10 out of 10. Which might, in, in my opinion, I think that's too much. I don't think it was perfect. But then we have another group of people rating it 1 out of 10. 24%. One out of four people that watched the show literally thought that it was so bad that they wanted to go out of their way and rate it one out of 10. It was, it was a completely trash show, worse than all the different shows that are twos and threes on IMDb. Now, of course, that's not the case. The reason people are going out of their way is they're upset about something with the, the way that it was translated from the book to the show. I understand that. But I will say this shows the overall controversy, the difference of opinions in this show. Um, in my opinion, my rating of it probably would have sat somewhere between a six and eight, probably around a seven and a half. That's what I would have given it. And ironically, that's around where the overall rating sits. So these groups of people that either loved it or hate it are kind of canceling each other out and giving it this mid-range rating. So this was a very controversial series, and it was also a series that so far has gotten a lot of views. The Lord of the Rings draws 25 million viewers in the series debut. That's within the first 24 hours. To give this a comparison, this is worldwide viewers. So 25 million worldwide. If we look at House of Dragon, drew in nearly 10 million viewers. So Amazon over doubled the amount of viewers as HBO, which in my opinion makes sense. Amazon has been putting banners on their homepage. They put a countdown clock next to the checkout of amazon.com. They have an unfair advantage and advertising their streaming service. No other company owns the top real estate of the top online platforms. So Amazon's doing what they do best, which is leveraging one part that they already have an advantage in, online retail, to help advantage their viewership and their shows, to help grow their prime service. So I think that this makes sense. They got 25 million viewers. We'll see if this falls off in the coming weeks or if the audience actually grows. But when I was thinking about this series overall and whether or not it's a good thing or bad thing for Amazon, I think it can go either way. There is a risk that Amazon does such a poor job with this series that it actually damages their brand, that people grow to hate Amazon because they ruined something as sacred as Tolkien's Lord of the Rings. That would be the bad outcome. I don't think the series is there yet. I don't think it's a disaster. That was not the take I got. I don't think it was perfect, but I definitely don't think it deserved a one, one out of 10 rating. Now, the upside for Amazon is they have 25 million viewers that watch the first couple episodes. There's probably gonna be a good amount of them that will wanna watch the next one. I know I'm part of that group. I like the second episode more than the first, and I might like the third more than the second. So I'm interested in seeing future episodes, and I'm one of those people that's not too picky about shows. And I think there's a decent amount of people that are in the same group. They want to see the upcoming episodes. So even though I think this has the potential to backfire on Amazon, if they do a terrible job and they give the whole streaming service a black eye, I think it has a lot more potential to do good, to have reduce churn on their Amazon Prime subscription, to put their streaming service on the map, and to make it so that they have more people signing up just because they want to view this series. So overall, I think this will have a small impact on Amazon's future, uh, either way, good or bad. It's not central to my investment thesis. I'm investing in Amazon because of AWS, their ads business, and their third-party retail business, not necessarily because of their media business. But in my opinion, I think so far, I think this has more potential to be good than bad. Now, on this note, we have another company that I'm asked about a lot, which is Warner Brothers Discovery. I feel like I might be one of the few that I'm also watching House of Dragon with the Rings of Power, and I'm enjoying both of them. I look forward to watching both of them. So I have both services. I'm enjoying both of them. I'm invested in Amazon and not Warner Brothers Discovery because of the same reasons that I've listed off in the past. I, I don't know for sure. I can't call this one for sure. I just have a suspicion 
that this might be a value trap. That is my concern. Their earnings report last quarter, I didn't think was good. I think a lot of things aren't going the way they want. And the biggest problem is they have a lot of debt. That is my biggest concern. $51.4 billion of long-term debt is an incredible amount of debt. And they're going to have to pay this off for years to get their leverage under control. So that's the biggest reason I'm not investing in this company. I like HBO Max. I think they have good content, but I do not like the amount of debt that they currently hold. Now, this last piece of news that I want to go over is a Wall Street Journal exclusive released just this morning. And this one is concerning. It goes over the continued extensive cost cutting that Netflix is doing. And I'll explain why this actually concerns me. They say in it, that Netflix is trying to save money as slowing subscriber growth. We all know that story. From paring back its real estate footprint to limiting corporate swag to controlling cloud computing costs and hiring junior staff. So they are changing everything in the company. This isn't just some layoffs. This isn't just a, a minor pullback in spending. They're literally reducing the amount of swag. They're, they're hiring junior staff, junior developers. Netflix was known for only hiring senior level developers. Everybody was all stars. Everybody was, was the best that you could find anywhere at any company. Now they're saying we need to save money. We need to cut, cut costs everywhere. Here's one example. Netflix is trying to better control rising cloud computing costs. So they're also going after their cloud computing provider, which is AWS. And this isn't the only company. There's probably a lot of companies that are trying to cut back on Azure and AWS spend. They say, according to people familiar with that work, Netflix aims to keep costs from ballooning as it tries to increase the subscriber base to as many as 500 million customers globally in the next three years, the people said. So even though they're doing cost cutting, I like to see that they still have ambitious goals. They're at 220 million subscribers right now. They want to increase that to 500 million. They are coming out with an ad portion of their business that should increase revenue. But the big problem that I see with this news story, my big concern is anytime a company does this level of cost cutting, this continued aggressive cost cutting where they're cutting swag, they're firing employees, they're cutting their AWS budget, they're going after every part they can to save any nickel or penny and a complete change in their company's culture, I don't view it as a good thing. I think this means that they're not confident in the numbers they're going to release. And I think that their next quarter will have poor numbers. That's my opinion. And I'm not saying that just to temper expectations. I really believe that. I think that Netflix's next quarter is probably not going to be good. When I look at the company, I try to differentiate between the next upcoming quarters and the long term. I still think the long term of the company is good. But this, this type of news of continued cost cutting is not a positive thing. So I'm going to continue to invest in Netflix. The valuation is very low right now at a 19 PE ratio. They still are a global company that has, I think, an immense amount of opportunity. I do think they can eventually grow to 500 million subscribers. So there are some positive things, but this year, 2022, I don't think is going to be a good one for Netflix. So that's my thoughts overall. I hope you enjoyed this little check-in and I'll see you in the next one.